come and see on a grander scale what Claude Monet saw in his own backyard, the extraordinary light of heaven illuminating the ordinary realities of our earth. Monet's 19, uh, excuse me, 1889 painting of a grain stack at sunset was the work of art that accompanied us on this journey. It's so radiant. I can't wait for you to see it in person if you haven't seen it already. Today we embark on a different journey through the gospel according to Matthew. And our destination is the same the beginnings of Jesus' earthly ministry, but our route is going to be different because Matthew offers us a different perspective than John, and we have a different but no less brilliant painting by a different but no less brilliant artist to accompany us on this trek. It's a painting by Emily Carr entitled trees in the sky that is reproduced on the front of your bulletin. Emily Carr is an artist that Kristen and I have actually just discovered through the Mystical Landscapes exhibit, hashtag ignorant Americans. <laughs> and we've quite enjoyed being enlightened, let me tell you. Emily Carr has many, many wonderful paintings. The first thing about this particular painting, though, that jumps out, at least it jumps out to my eyes, is these tall, spindly trees that are reaching up toward the sky. They don't look like any trees that you and I would see anywhere in the world. They actually remind me more of arrows or maybe mushrooms. But that's because Emily Carr, as an artist, was not interested in capturing forms. What she was interested in was capturing the spiritual nature, the spiritual energy inside and underneath the forms that we see. And what trees these are. They're vibrant. They're so tall, almost impossibly tall, yet... They're also fragile, being so thin. Much of the rest of the setting is vibrant, too. All around the trees is this lush greenery underneath a blue sky, and all of it is rippling and undulating with energy and with life. It actually makes you wonder if the trees are pushing upward or are they being drawn upward? up toward heaven. The tall trees also have these short, little, stubby, parallel limbs jutting out of them. They remind me of ladders, perhaps suggesting a way to climb, a way that we too might reach up to heaven. They're high off the ground, though, out of reach. Maybe they're coming down rather than going up, and it's whatever's going on, the process is not yet complete. But there's also something else in this landscape. There's something amiss. These tall, slender trees are new growth rising up out of some sort of calamity because at the base of their wispy trunks are the dead stumps of many other trees. Something has invaded this landscape, and while it may be out of frame now or hidden beneath all the new growth that is coming back, fighting back. The shadows and the darkness in the middle of the landscape convey a sense that it's still present, it's still lurking. Some of the dead trees look broken, as if they may have fallen victim to fire or perhaps a lightning strike. But we cannot dismiss their fate or ascribe it simply to natural disaster, because just behind those stumps are the stumps of other trees that have clearly been chopped down, sawed off, 
Whatever befell this landscape, it wasn't just nature run amok. Human hands have been at work, destructive hands. And it's actually, therefore, a landscape that is reminiscent of Matthew chapter 4, where we encounter Jesus this morning. Like the landscape in trees in the sky, there's something vibrant and new that's happening in Matthew 4. Jesus is on the move. He's calling people to repentance, calling people to come and be healed, calling people to come and follow Him to become His disciples. But there's also something sinister afoot in our gospel passage this morning. Shadows that are lurking in this lush, bright scene of Jesus' ministry coming to life. Shadows that we find in the very first verse of the story, which I must confess is a sentence I have usually skimmed right over or rushed right through on my way to getting into the meat of what Matthew has to tell us, but it really jumped out at me this time. Matthew says, when John was arrested, Jesus withdrew to Galilee. When John was arrested. In Matthew's telling, This is actually the first event of Jesus' ministry, the arrest of John the Baptist. It's a little curious that Matthew doesn't say anything else about this rather significant event, at least not for ten more chapters. But whatever Matthew's reasons for wanting to constructing wanting to construct his narrative in this particular way, he definitely wants us to know that the launch of Jesus' ministry coincides with this act of political injustice. And as we continue to read the gospel, we discover it is quite clearly an act of political injustice. This is what Matthew eventually tells us in chapter 14. At that time, Herod the ruler heard reports about Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. For Herod had arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had been telling him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Though Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company, and she pleased Herod so much that he promised on oath to grant her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison. The head was brought on a platter and given to the girl who brought it to her mother. His disciples came and took the body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. When John was arrested, Jesus withdrew to Galilee. This introductory sentence might be short, but it is no small thing. It is naming an abuse of power as flippant as it is outrageous. 
the puppet overlord of an imperial occupying power, silencing a prophet of the Lord who dared to criticize him, who dared to call him out, to challenge Herod's royal prerogative to do as he pleased. The same Herod, whom you'll remember, ordered every infant in Bethlehem under the age of two to be murdered simply because the Magi had come asking, where is the child that has been born king of the Jews? Herod will not permit any challenge to his authority, and any perceived threat will be eradicated. That's how coercive power works. Rulers rule and subjects submit, and if they don't, then they are subjugated by any means necessary. This is the context, the political reality into which Jesus is born and into which he comes of age. This is the political reality in which he launches his earthly ministry, and it is telling that Matthew uses the same Greek word, anachoreo, to describe Jesus departing for Galilee that he used to describe Joseph and Mary's departure for Egypt when they were fleeing Herod's slaughter. It's a direct but subtle way that Matthew uses to connect these two acts of tyranny closely together as he unfolds his narrative. So then, my brothers and sisters, what we are witnessing is, in a very real real way, not just the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, but the beginning of his response to this sort of toxic, twisted, and dangerous environment which is, on the one hand, Jesus taking it very, very seriously. He is withdrawing, but He's also working actively to subvert it and to model an alternative. Jesus doesn't go to Galilee to raise an army, to fight fire with fire, but He also doesn't go there to hide to keep his head down and keep his nose clean, just to keep out of Herod's way so hopefully everything will be all right. No. He goes to Galilee to counter darkness with light and to begin cultivating hope in the arid soil of this fear and oppression by calling people to repentance, by gathering a group of disciples around him forming community, a community of learning and brotherhood rooted in the good news of the kingdom of heaven, the incarnation of God's love and grace, and then by going out and healing of sharing of himself and the life that is within him, affecting transformation, but also blessing others empowering those whom he is gathering around him to go out and do the very same things. It's an approach that is absolutely the opposite of Herod's. Jesus giving his power away, sharing it, rather trying to consolidate it and preserve it and leverage it. And it's an example for us to emulate as we too try to navigate our own uncertain and unjust world. Thankfully, we can praise God because we do not live in the same kind of political environment that Jesus did, not even close. But there are millions of people who still do, and there will always be political and economic realities that are beyond our control with which we will have to contend and under which we will have to live. 
And the response that we see Jesus cultivating here in Matthew chapter 4 is only the beginning. There will be more to come as Jesus teaches and heals, and as He and the disciples move out into the world. There will be challenges to authority, both religious and political. There will be greater and greater transformations affected as the kingdom becomes incarnate and comes nearer through Jesus and the disciples' presence. But this is where it starts, and this is where it ultimately holds together through this cultivation of hope, through community, relationship, and shared pilgrimage in commitment to an alternative reality, an alternative vision of life and living, which is the kingdom of heaven. It's not an imaginary kingdom. It's simply a kingdom that lies beyond the forms of our world, a reality not unlike that which Emily Carr sees in her landscapes, a kingdom that ripples and pulses with the life that truly is life, a kingdom that is embodied in Christ and also in you and me as His living body, the church, as Christ's people, a kingdom that can and will overgrow and overrun the shadowy darkness that still lurks in this world if, if we have eyes to see it, if we have ears to hear it, and if we have the faith and the courage to embrace it. Jesus is raising us up to be like the trees in trees in the sky, to be the new growth, to be the new possibility, to be different. Different growth, vibrant, resilient, but also fragile, reaching ever higher and higher toward heaven, but standing not on our own strength, but on His strength. And that's why I think these trees don't have thick trunks. They don't need them, and they shouldn't have them, because what trees sprouting up from the life that truly is life need is to be pliable and malleable so that they can be continually pulled and stretched and transformed so that the good news of the kingdom can continue to shift our perspectives and our understandings. So I actually need to detract something that I said earlier, because I said when I first began that these trees that Emily Carr has painted here in this painting aren't like any trees that we would see anywhere in our world. But that's not true. We do see them. We see them anywhere and everywhere that the gospel is lived out. I've seen them growing right here at Kingsway Baptist Church. Alan has testified this morning he has seen them too. There are so many things we can't control. We can't control sometimes where our jobs will take us. We can't control what happens to our health or the health of others whom we love. We can't control whether people around us are diagnosed with cancer or perhaps they become affected with Bell's palsy. But we can choose to have an active compassion or a passive compassion. And as difficult as these past few weeks have been for me and my family at times, I can stand here today and testify to you, my brothers and sisters, that the love and grace that Kristen has received, that I have received, that Mary and Emma have received from you has helped healing to take place in Kristen's life, has helped us get through this rough patch. We see trees like 
Emily Carr's growing in other churches around the world as well. Churches like Broadway United Methodist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. At one time, Broadway was the largest church in that state. Not just the largest Methodist church, the largest church in that state. They had a wonderful, beautiful sanctuary, buildings built right in the heart of that great city. What was then actually the first beginnings of the suburbs. But as time went on, the city grew, and those suburbs turned into the inner city. And a lot of the people who went to that church fled what Indianapolis was becoming. And there's not a lot that Broadway could or can do now about that larger economic and political reality, but they could do something about how they chose to live in that context and in that environment. A lot of churches in that same position pack up and move out, but Broadway has stayed, and they have not only stayed, they have chosen to live in that place in a way that is firmly rooted in the kingdom of heaven and to live out that faith. Broadway's pastor, Mike Mather, says they embrace what he calls a realized eschatology. We believe, he says, that the kingdom of heaven has come near. The blind see, the deaf hear, the prisoners are set free. We just have to have the eyes to see it and the ears to hear it. And that attitude has helped them to transform their surrounding community. Visitors to Broadway who go there to attend events are often surprised to learn that the gathering they have just attended in someone's home has been hosted by someone who is not a member of Broadway United Methodist Church. And their minds are blown. And they ask Mike all the time, how did... How did you pull that off? How does this person who doesn't even attend your church host this meal, fix food for people at Broadway? And he says, because we asked them to. He says, we do a lot of asking because we believe the kingdom of God has come near, and we treat people as if they are people made in the image of that God. And so we treat them as people having something to offer rather than simply having needs that require fixing. And he says they respond. They respond with generosity and with grace. It's not always how it's been there, though. Mike tells a story about when he first got started in his ministry there, that they tried to establish a community garden. They realized that people having healthy food to eat in this part of town was a problem. And so they got the idea, let's start a community garden. And they brought in uh, someone from the University of Indiana to come and teach people how to make, a, you know, uh, how to make this garden you know, an expert, and it didn't fly. People didn't take to it. And he was really disappointed. He thought, man, this was really such a wonderful idea. What happened? Why didn't it go forward? And somebody then came up to him and said, well, you know, there's a couple people across the street who are gardeners. And so he asked this young man in the congregation who was one of those people who kind of knows everybody and who's just, who always knows what the latest conversations are, he said, can you go find out how many gardeners we have in our, in, just in the surrounding neighborhood here? And he came back a few days later and he says, Mike, there are 38 people <laughs> who garden <laughs> right around here. And so we'll say, why don't we, instead of bringing an expert in, let's talk to them. And as a result of that, not only has a community garden been established and has flourished, but these poor people, whom so much of Indianapolis write off 
as those people who are just there to be fixed and who need to be helped have a farmer's market in the parking lot of the hospital that's nearby. They are selling fresh fruits and vegetables to the nurses and the doctors who live just beyond their neighborhood. And their lives have been transformed because they're learning to think about themselves differently. They respond with grace and generosity. This is where we see trees like Emily Carr's growing. Anywhere and everywhere that a hand of fellowship is extended, where grace is extended, where love of neighbor and love of God are practiced, life begins to bubble up, to spring up, and it will overrun whatever shadows and darkness ultimately still lurk in our world if we will have eyes to see and ears to hear and faith to follow where Jesus leads us, to trust that we don't need strong, thick trunks to stand on our own strength, but thin, pliable ones to allow Jesus to continue to stretch us and push us and transform us and help us to develop these little ladders that come down that not only we can climb toward heaven, but others may too. May God help us to have that kind of faith. And may the Holy Spirit open our eyes and our ears. Amen.